Section 4 of The Captain of the Pole Star and Other Tales by Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. J. Habakkuk Jefferson's Statement, Part 1. In the month of December in the year 1873, the British ship De Gracia steered into Gibraltar, having in tow the derelict brigantine Marie Celeste, which had been picked up in latitude. 38 degrees, 40 minutes, longitude, 17 degrees, 15 minutes west. There were several circumstances in connection with the condition and appearance of this abandoned vessel, which excited considerable comment at the time, and aroused a curiosity which has never been satisfied. What these circumstances were was summed up in an able article which appeared in the Gibraltar Gazette. The curious can find it in the issue for January 4th, 1874, unless my memory deceives me. For the benefit of those, however, who may be unable to refer to the paper in question, I shall subjoin a few extracts which touch upon the leading features of the case. We have ourselves, says the anonymous writer in the Gazette, been over the derelict Marie Celeste, and have closely questioned the officers of the De Gracia, on every point which might throw light on the affair. They are of opinion that she had been abandoned several days or perhaps weeks before being picked up. The official log, which was found in the cabin, states that the vessel sailed from Boston to Lisbon, starting upon October 16th. It is, however, most imperfectly kept and affords little information. There is no reference to rough weather, and indeed, the state of the vessel's paint and rigging excludes the idea that she was abandoned for any such reason. She is perfectly watertight. No signs of a struggle or of violence are to be detected, and there is absolutely nothing to account for the disappearance of the crew. There are several indications that a lady was present on board, a sewing machine being found in the cabin and some articles of female attire. These probably belong to the captain's wife, who is mentioned in the log as having accompanied her husband. As an instance of the mildness of the weather, it may be remarked that a bobbin of silk was found standing upon the sewing machine, though the least roll of the vessel would have precipitated it to the floor. The boats were intact and slung upon the davits, and the cargo consisting of tallow and American clocks, was untouched. An old-fashioned sword of curious workmanship was discovered among some lumber in the forecastle, and this weapon is said to exhibit a longitudinal striation on the steel, as if it had been recently wiped. It has been placed in the hands of the police and submitted to Dr. Monaghan, the analyst for inspection. The result of his examination has not yet been published. We may remark in conclusion that Captain Dalton of the De Gracia, an able and intelligent seaman, is of opinion that the Marie Celeste may have been abandoned a considerable distance from the spot at which she was picked up, since a powerful current runs in that latitude from the African coast. He confesses his inability, however, to advance any hypotheses which can reconcile all the facts of the case. In the utter absence of a clue or grain of evidence, it is to be feared that the fate of the crew of the Marie Celeste will be added to those numerous mysteries of the deep which will never be solved until the great day when the sea shall give up its dead. If crime has been committed, as is much to be suspected, there is little hope of bringing the perpetrators to justice. I shall supplement this extract from the Gibraltar Gazette by quoting a telegram from Boston, which went the round of the English papers and represented the total amount of information which had been collected about the Marie Celeste. She was, it said, a brigantine of 170 tons burden, and belonged to White Russell and White, wine importers of this city. Captain J. W. Tibbs was an old servant of the firm and was a man of known ability and tried probity. He was accompanied by his wife, aged thirty-one, 
and their youngest child, five years old. The crew consisted of seven hands, including two colored seamen and a boy. There were three passengers, one of whom was the well-known Brooklyn specialist on consumption, Dr. Habakkuk Jefferson, who was a distinguished advocate of abolition in the early days of the movement and whose pamphlet entitled, Where is Thy Brother?, exercised a strong influence on public opinion before the war. The other passengers were Mr. J. Harton, a writer in the employ of the firm, and Mr. Septimus Goring, a half-caste gentleman from New Orleans. All investigations have failed to throw any light upon the fate of these fourteen human beings. The loss of Dr. Jefferson will be felt both in political and scientific circles. I have here epitomized, for the benefit of the public, all that has been hitherto known concerning the Marie Celeste and her crew, for the past ten years have not in any way helped to elucidate the mystery. I have now taken up my pen with the intention of telling all that I know of the ill-fated voyage. I consider that it is a duty which I owe to society, for symptoms in which I am familiar with in others lead me to believe that before many months my tongue and hand may be alike incapable of conveying information. Let me remark, as a preface to my narrative, that I am Joseph Habakkuk Jefferson, Doctor of Medicine of the University of Harvard, an ex-consulting physician of the Samaritan Hospital of Brooklyn. Many will doubtless wonder why I have not proclaimed myself before, and why I have suffered so many conjectures and surmises to pass unchallenged. Could the ends of justice have been served in any way by my revealing the facts in my possession, I should have unhesitatingly have done so. It seemed to me, however, that there was no possibility of such a result, and when I attempted, after the occurrence, to state my case to an English official, I was met with such offensive incredulity that I determined never again to expose myself to the chance of such an indignity. I can excuse the discourtesy of the Liverpool magistrate, however, when I reflect upon the treatment which I received at the hands of my own relatives, who, though they knew my unimpeachable character, listened to my statement with an indulgent smile as if humoring the delusion of a monomaniac. This slur upon my veracity led to a quarrel between myself and John Van Berger, the brother of my wife, and confirmed me in my resolution to let the matter sink into oblivion, a determination which I have only altered through my son's solicitations. In order to make my narrative intelligible, I must run lightly over one or two incidents in my former life which throw light upon subsequent events. My father, William K. Jefferson, was a preacher of the sect called Plymouth Brethren and was one of the most respected citizens of Lowell. Like most of the other Puritans of New England, he was a determined opponent to slavery, and it was from his lips that I received those lessons which tinged every action of my life. While I was studying medicine at Harvard University, I had already made a mark as an advanced abolitionist, and when, after taking my degree, I bought a third share of the practice of Dr. Willis of Brooklyn, I managed, in spite of my professional duties, to devote a considerable time to the cause which I had at heart. My pamphlet, Where is Thy Brother? Swarburg, Lister & Company, 1859, attracting considerable attention. When the war broke out, I left Brooklyn and accompanied the 113th New York Regiment through the campaign. I was present at the Second Battle of Bull's Run and the Battle of Gettysburg. Finally, I was severely wounded at Antietam and would probably have perished on the field had it not been for the kindness of a gentleman named Murray, who had me carried to his house and provided me with every comfort. Thanks to his charity, and to the nursing which I received from his black domestics, I was soon able to get about the plantation 
with the help of a stick. It was during this period of convalescence that an incident occurred which is closely connected with my story. Among the most assiduous of the negresses who watched my couch during my illness, there was one old crone who appeared to exert considerable authority over the others. She was exceedingly attentive to me, and I gathered from the few words that passed between us that she had heard of me and that she was grateful to me for championing her oppressed race. One day, as I was sitting alone in the veranda, basking in the sun, and debating whether I should rejoin Grant's army, I was surprised to see this old creature hobbling towards me. After looking cautiously around to see that we were alone, she fumbled in the front of her dress and produced a small chamois leather bag, which hung round her neck by a white cord. Massa, she said, bending down and croaking the words into my ear, me die soon, me very old woman, not stay long on Massa Murray's plantation. You may live a long time yet, Martha, I answered. You know I am a doctor. If you feel ill, let me know about it, and I will try to cure you. No wish to live, wish to die. I'm going to join the heavenly host. Here she relapsed into one of those half-heathenish rhapsodies in which Negroes indulge. But, Massa, me have one thing must leave behind me when I go. Not able to take it with me across the Jordan. That one thing very precious, more precious and more holy than all things else in the world. Me, a poor old black woman, have this because my people, very great people, suppose they was back in the old country. But you cannot understand this same as black folk could. My father gave it to me, and his father gave it to him. And now, who shall I give it to? Poor Martha have no children, no relation, nobody. All around I see black man, very bad man. Black woman, very stupid women. Nobody worth of the stone. And so I say, here is Master Jefferson, who write books and fight for colored folk. He must be a good man, and he shall have it, though he is a white man, and never can know what it means or where it came from. Here the old woman fumbled in her chamois leather bag and pulled out a flattish black stone with a hole through the middle of it. Here, take it, she said, pressing it into my hand. Take it. No harm never come from anything good. Keep it safe, never lose it. And with a warning gesture, the old crone hobbled away in the same cautious way as she had come, looking from side to side to see if we had been observed. I was more amused than impressed by the old woman's earnestness, and was only prevented from laughing during her oration by the fear of hurting her feelings. When she was gone, I took a good look at the stone which she had given me. It was intensely black, of extreme hardness, and oval in shape, just such a flat stone as one would pick up on the seashore if one wished to throw a long way. It was about three inches long and an inch and a half broad at the middle, but rounded off at the extremities. The most curious part about it were several well-marked ridges which ran in semicircles over its surface and gave it exactly the appearance of a human ear. Altogether, I was rather interested in my new possession and determined to submit it as a geological specimen to my friend Professor Schroeder of the New York Institute upon the earliest opportunity. In the meantime, I thrust it into my pocket and, rising from my chair, started off for a short stroll in the shrubbery, dismissing the incident from my mind. As my wound had nearly healed by this time, I took my leave of Mr. Murray shortly afterwards. The Union armies were everywhere victorious and converging on Richmond, so that my assistance seemed unnecessary, and I returned to Brooklyn. There I resumed my practice and married the second daughter of Josiah Van Berger, the well-known wood engraver. In the course of a few years, I built up a good connection and acquired considerable reputation 
in the treatment of pulmonary complaints. I still kept the old black stone in my pocket and frequently told the story of the dramatic way in which I had become possessed of it. I also kept my resolution of showing it to Professor Schroeder, who was much interested both by the anecdote and the specimen. He pronounced it to be a piece of meteorotic stone and drew my attention to the fact that its resemblance to an ear was not accidental, but that it was most carefully worked into that shape. A dozen little anatomical points showed that the worker had been as accurate as he was skillful. I should not wonder, said the professor, if it were broken off from some larger statue, though how such hard material could be so perfectly worked is more than I can understand. If there is a statue to correspond, I should like to see it. So I thought at the time, but I have changed my opinion since. The next seven or eight years of my life were quiet and uneventful. Summer followed spring, and spring followed winter, without any variation in my duties. As the practice increased, I admitted J. S. Jackson as partner, he to have one-fourth of the profits. The continued strain had told upon my constitution, however, and I became at last so unwell that my wife insisted upon my consulting Dr. Cavanaugh Smith, who was my colleague at the Samaritan Hospital. The gentleman examined me and pronounced the apex of my left lung to be in a state of consolidation, recommending me, at the same time, to go through a course of medical treatment and to take a long sea voyage. My own disposition, which is naturally restless, predisposed me strongly in favor of the latter piece of advice, and the matter was clinched by my meeting young Russell, of the firm of White, Russell & White, who offered me a passage in one of his father's ships, the Marie Celeste, which was just starting from Boston. She is a snug little ship, he said, and Tibbs, the captain, is an excellent fellow. There is nothing like a sailing ship for an invalid. I was very much of the same opinion myself, so I closed with the offer on the spot. My original plan was that my wife should accompany me on my travels. She has always been a very poor sailor, however, and there were strong family reasons against her exposing herself to any risk at the time, so we determined that she should remain at home. I am not a religious or an effusive man, but oh, thank God for that. As to leaving my practice, I was easily reconciled to it, as Jackson, my partner, was a reliable and hard-working man. I arrived in Boston on October 12, 1873, and proceeded immediately to the office of the firm in order to thank them for their courtesy. As I was sitting in the counting house, waiting until they should be at liberty to see me, the words Marie Celeste suddenly attracted my attention. I looked round and saw a very tall, gaunt man who was leaning across the polished mahogany counter, asking some questions of the clerk at the other side. His face was half turned towards me, and I could see that he had a strong dash of negro blood in him. Being probably a quadroon, or even nearer akin to the black, his curved aquiline nose and straight lank hair showed the white strain, but the dark restless eyes, sensuous mouth, and gleaming teeth all told of his African origin. His complexion was of a sickly, unhealthy yellow, and his face was deeply pitted with smallpox. The general impression was so unfavorable as to be almost revolting. When he spoke, however, it was in a soft, melodious voice and in well-chosen words, as he was evidently a man of some education. I wished to ask a few questions about the Marie Celeste, he repeated, leaning across to the clerk. She sails the day after tomorrow, does she not? Yes, sir, said the young clerk, awed into unusual politeness by the glimmer of a large diamond in the stranger's shirt front. Where is she bound for? Lisbon. How many of a crew? Seven, sir. Passengers? Yes, two. One of our young gentlemen and a doctor from New York. 
No gentleman from the South? asked the stranger eagerly. No, none, sir. Is there room for another passenger? Accommodation for three more, answered the clerk. I'll go, said the quadroon decisively. I'll go. I'll engage my passage at once. Put it down, will you? Mr. Septimus Goring of New Orleans. The clerk filled up a form and handed it over to the stranger, pointing to a blank space at the bottom. As Mr. Goring stooped over to sign it, I was horrified to observe that the fingers of his right hand had been lopped off and that he was holding the pen between his thumb and the palm. I have seen thousands slain in battle and assisted at every conceivable surgical operation, but I cannot recall any sight which gave me such a thrill of disgust as that great brown sponge-like hand with a single member protruding from it. He used it skillfully enough, however, for, dashing off his signature, he nodded to the clerk and strolled out of the office just as Mr. White sent out word that he was ready to receive me. I went down to the Marie Celeste that evening and looked over my berth, which was extremely comfortable considering the small size of the vessel. Mr. Goring, whom I had seen in the morning, was to have the one next mine. Opposite was the captain's cabin, and a small berth for Mr. John Harton, a gentleman who was going out in the interests of the firm. These little rooms were arranged on either side of the passage, which led from the main deck to the saloon. The latter was a comfortable room, the paneling tastefully done in oak and mahogany, with a rich Brussels carpet and luxurious settees. I was very much pleased with the accommodation, and also with Tibbs, the captain, a bluff, sailor-like fellow with a loud voice and hearty manner, who welcomed me to the ship with effusion and insisted upon our splitting a bottle of wine in his cabin. He told me that he intended to take his wife and youngest child with him on the voyage, and that he hoped with good luck to make Lisbon in three weeks. We had a pleasant chat and parted the best of friends, he warning me to make the last of my preparations next morning, as he intended to make a start by the midday tide, having now shipped all his cargo. I went back to my hotel, where I found a letter from my wife awaiting me, and after a refreshing night's sleep, returned to the boat in the morning. From this point, I am able to quote from the journal which I kept in order to vary the monotony of the long sea voyage. If it is somewhat bald in places, I can at least rely upon its accuracy and details, as it was written conscientiously from day to day. End of section 4